Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma bar habita fillah Continue on in our study of Balooga Maram Kitaba Jami' Bab The Bab of Good Manners The Chapter of Good Manners Husn al-Khulq And This group of ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam <coughs> involves the study of some of the manners and ways of conducting uh, ourselves around other believers, meaning the adab of the majlis or mujalis, you know, the the how to interact with one another in when it comes to reserving a seat in a majlis and that shows us the completeness of the shar that even with regards to small mannerisms like that or things we regard as small mannerisms that Islam has a way of dealing with uh, 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 of a certain type of, uh, of conduct and mannerisms in which we should observe with regards to those issues and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with ikhlas with the bat and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with benefit from that which we are learning and protect us from from knowledge which is not beneficial and so moving into this group of ahadith of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam uh, the first hadith is hadith 1239 narrated Ibn Mas'ud Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said when three of you are together two must not talk privately ignoring the other till you mix with other people since that will cause him grief, mutafakun alayh, meaning Bukhari and Muslim, and the wording is that of Muslim. This hadith shows us the adab, the etiquette of how we should be in the company of others. And this can both include when you are speaking to someone and not including another uh, individual in your conversation who is close by you or you are ignoring that individual or this is also inclusive of when you speak uh, another language and sometimes this is often unfortunately something that we abuse often you may be in a sitting and everyone speaks Arabic to a great greater or lesser extent, or maybe there's an individual who doesn't speak Arabic, and the people are speaking Arabic, and they leave out that individual. Uh, likewise, the opposite can be the case. So it's very important to include everyone present, uh, as long as it's not going to be harmful, uh, as long as it's uh, there, uh, especially if there's going to be harm or maybe something a person's going to feel insulted or left out of the conversation or the gathering. So this hadith of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, said, Ida kuntum Falatha Fala Tunaja Fala Yatanaja is name Dunil Akhr Hatta Tahtalitu bin Nas bin Ejli and Navalika Yahzenohu Mutafakun Ali. So in the Hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam showed us that this could be something which is harmful. For the person left out of the conversation. So he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Two must not talk privately, ignoring the other. So again, the first uh, way in which this can be bothersome is you're ignoring someone. 
till you mix with other people, since that will cause him grief. Because this and the sabab, the ilil, as we mentioned prior to this, that often the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was teaching and giving instructions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is he gave the reason, he gave you know, the consequences that if you do such and such, such and such will happen. So if you conduct yourself in this way, you ignore your brother in this gathering, he, he will feel insulted. He'll feel left out. So this is why we should not do such a uh, such practice, such, uh, such an activity, because we don't want to cause harm to our brother, insulting our brother, making our brother feel less important or left out. And in this uh, <coughs> regard, in this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we learn uh, several uh, benefits there. And again, as we mentioned that this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we mentioned in the prior lesson, that uh, often from the husn al the uh, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from the excellent way of teaching of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, is that he would, uh, he would give the reasons. Often he would give us the ilm, the reason. And this brings more comfort to the heart. So here he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave us the reason of why not to do such an activity, even though we do it. We know this hadith, but we tend to uh, fall into this. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. I mean, ya Rabbil Alameen. And he said, Min ajli anna thalika yahsunhu. Yahsunhu. Uh, and, th this is re the, and this is because, so he's given us the reason, this will cause him sadness. You know, this could cause him grief. From the fuayat of this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, is first that this hadith shows us that the Sharia uh, goes against or it does not allow anything which will violate the Muslim Brotherhood. And that it goes against those things which cause harm or grief to any one of the believers. So that's a very important point that uh, this hadith shows us. Here is a situation where you just have one individual who may feel insulted and sad. But the Sharia urges us. And uh, from the prophetic guidance is that we should not, if we are in the company of three, that two people should not hold a conversation at the exclusion of the other person, meaning that we should speak in a way that it's uh, that we're whispering so this other person can't hear, or that we should, uh, you know, basically not include them in the conversation, you know, especially uh, if it r r involves ignoring them or something that's going to harm or insult them. And this can be done also by speaking another language at their expense, especially if everyone's able to communicate uh, a single language. Another benefit of this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is it shows us Tahrim Idhal al husn al akhi Muslim. Uh, the impermissibility of causing grief to your uh, Muslim brother. And that is because, as we mentioned this qa'ida many times, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said, فَلَا يَتَنَاجَ uh, He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so do not have these, you know, these private exclusive, uh, exclusionary councils. And this is a uh, a nahi. This is a nahi, meaning this is a prohibition. This is a a uh, not a command, but it's a prohibition. And a prohibition is 
either a prohibition, it could be a nahi li uh, tahrim, or a nahi lil karaha, uh, meaning that it can be a prohibition which shows that something is muharram, completely um, uh, sinful, or it could be a prohibition which shows that something <clears throat> is disliked. And so with that being the case, here the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he gave us a prohibition here. You know, it was a, a prohibitory command, if you will. And that we know the asl of the nahi, a nahi, you feed a tahreem. So that a nahi, uh, uh, a prohibition, in the asl, in the origin of the shar, shows that something is muharram, it's impermissible. So here the Prophet ﷺ negated this so that we would not harm uh, the our, our brother or sister Muslim, even as a, an individual. Because the idha, meaning the harm, is, is sinful, it's impermissible. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al-Kareem, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بِغَيْرِ مَا اكْتَسِبُوا فَكَدْ اَحْتَمَلُوا بُحْتَانًا بُحْتَانًا وَإِثْمًا مُبِينًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ahzab verse 58 Subhana He says and those who cause harm to the believing men and the believing women without them having uh, earned that, then they have, they gain or carry, they, they have uh, done a, a, a wicked lie. So if they, you've claimed something about something, which about someone which is going to cause them harm on their character, whatever the case, and you've done this out of a lie, then this is a major wicked sin, a lie, وَإِثْمًا mubina, And a clear sin. So this is something very sinful. So it shows us what? That it's impermissible to harm your Muslim brother or Muslim sister. Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is that this hadith also <clears throat> that what we understand from this hadith is that if there are four people or more, and they ha and two people are having a conversation between them, then it is not impermissible. That's what we understand from this hadith that that's okay if two people are excluded because they can have a conversation. It's not exclusionary to the group. So uh, in this situation, that this is not impermissible because two people generally will not be al ghalib. And that's what a lot of the ahkam in the shahr, a lot of the rulings per, pertain to the what mostly is the case. And so al-ghalib, what's mostly the case, is people, two people, would not feel insulted most of the time. There can be those rare in, uh, instances, but mostly al hukm al-ghalib. Uh, another uh, benefit of this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that if three people speak, uh, <clears throat> meaning uh, if you're in a gathering of three and two people are speaking together in a foreign language as we mentioned to the exclusion of the other one even if it is not quietly and it's done out loud that this is impermissible okay so if this is the case meaning if, if, if it's of course, if it's it's possible. For example, if someone, if people are doing this, for example, you're three, and you're sitting uh, with a sheikh, and the sheikh speaks Arabic only, maybe, and the person, there's one person acting as a translator. This is this is a different s scenario, and then he's translating back and forth. This is not the situation that we are uh, discussing here of being impermissible. But this is when two people. When they are doing that and it's excluding another person either deliberately or, you know, it's going to cause harm to that person uh, when it's possible for everyone to speak the same language or 
or at least uh, not to, to include everyone in the conversation. So that's very important for us to understand that in the context. And again, going back to, the, to what we mentioned, is that the intent is not to insult or not to harm, not to exclude, not to ignore your Muslim brother or Muslim sister. And you can see this, and that even this situation, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, even with regards to the conduct of, uh, uh, with regards to a non-Muslim. Maybe you have non-Muslim family members or you're in a gathering of non-Muslims, but for you and someone else to speak another language, when that person can speak the language, and you're excluding your non-Muslim relative or whatever the case may be, that this is, this is uh, from general mannerisms that even non-Muslims would find that, uh, you know, insulting. You know, if you're going to have a big, long conversation and you're excluding one individual, that instead, you know, for anyone, regardless of whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, they're going to feel left out at least and possibly insulted and possibly humiliated or hurt or suspicious that maybe they're being spoken about. So it's very important to observe these prophetic mannerisms that we see uh are in accordance with uh, a lot of uh, you know cultural traditions and common sense. Another uh, benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that if there are three people and they are uh, and two are having a conversation and one person is not concerned at all. They're not listening. They're doing some other activity. Uh, and they're not concerned about it at all. You know, and it's not going to harm them or affect them. Then this is this is no problem. So again, it goes back to the illa. It goes back to the illa of this hadith. The, the and it shows us this hadith shows us the wisdom of the shar, and that ahl sunnah pays attention to the illa as well. It's not just by taking the apparent meaning of the hadith and running with it but it you know this hadith mentioned also in illa it mentioned within it the reason behind that so as not to insult your brother not to harm your brother so if the person is not at all concerned for example you're in a gathering of three and one person is busy they're checking their phone and you two are speaking another language two of the individuals are speaking another language and the third person is playing on their phone and they don't understand that language so they're not included they're not concerned because they're busy in another conversation or doing some other activity and they're not even concerned so in that situation that does not apply and it is not harming them and there is no sin and there's no problem with that uh, another uh, benefit of this hadith and uh, Ben Rafaimin is mentioning basically what we just uh, said is أن الأحكام شرعية مبنية على العلل والمناسبات. Uh, he says that the Sharia rulings, that they are built upon, you know, wisdom or or reasons. You know, there's a reason for these things, and there is uh, utility. Meaning, there's usefulness in these أحكام. They're not just you know, this is impermissible just for the heck of being impermissible. No, there's a divine wisdom we may or may not know all the time. But in many situations, we know, we understand some of that hikmah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us or blessed the ulama with that. So that way we understand the reasoning. So that is a, a very important and that's that the sharia is built upon that. That there are reasons for the prohibitions and reasons for those things being permissible and so on and so forth. Another last benefit of this hadith is, this goes back to what we discussed prior, is that this also illustrates, uh, this illustrates that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam was the best uh, of teachers. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he was giving the message of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and, and a person given that responsibility has to be the best at articulating that message at giving and demonstrating that message and he sallallahu alaihi wasallam was that individual sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam so those are some of the main benefits of that hadith of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the next hadith hadith 1240 
narrated Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a man must not make another get up from his place and then occupy it himself. But you should spread out and make room. Mutafakun Ali. In this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam, it illustrates the adab or the mannerisms to be observed in the majalis, in the places of uh, sitting. And as we mentioned in the hadith prior to this, which also was pertinent to that same, uh, those same mannerisms that should be observed, that this hadith more specifically refers to uh, saving one's place and not overcoming or taking someone's place when they have, uh, they are either the person who resides there or it's a person who has reserved the uh, place. So uh, this hadith, this hadith states that if a person happens to occupy a space in the masjid, for example, or any other place which is not, uh, which is like a public uh, place, <clears throat> the space thus occupied belongs to him alone and no one has a right to overcome him or, or take it. And so this is a part of Islamic mannerisms. For example, if a person uh, were sitting in the masjid, or a group of people were sitting in the masjid, and then another individual comes, uh, that other new individual does not have a right to take any specific individual to take their spot, to take their place and, and for them to get up and leave or to move uh, into another uh, place. But rather, all the people, they have their place or they've reserved their place and the person coming, even if they have great status and so forth, they are not uh, to take the place of uh, the people sitting. So everyone has their right. That is their right. And it shows that it has relevance because we think of that as something small. But in fact, it's from the Sunnah of the Message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he emphasized it for a reason. That to show that the place in which a person is in, that that is their place. That they have precedence over that place. And no one can take that just because of their status or due to force or... Uh, being, uh, you know, through aggression or what have you. So, Ibn Umar, radiallahu ta'ala, he said that, uh, narrated, uh, Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, a man must not make another get up from his place and then occupy it himself. Uh, but you should spread out and make room. So, what we learn as a means for exemplifying this adab, this prophetic uh, adab, is that rather the people should make effort to make more room to spread out so that uh, uh, the person who is coming to the majlis, who is coming to the sitting place, to the in the living room, or in the masjid, to the halakha, you know, to the... Um, the place where they're learning Quran or they're studying or what have you, that people should make room for them. And so a person should not come and then someone gets up so that way that person can take their spot. And especially at the behest of the person who is coming to the majlis. That is not their right, but the right belongs to the person sitting. And rather, as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advised or commanded, if you will, that the people in the majlis should make room for, for someone coming. And this is what we understand from the zahir or from the uh, apparent meaning of this nas, of this text. So from some of the fawaid, some of the benefits that we gain from this hadith uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
is the impermissibility of a person <coughs> making another person move from his spot so that that person can sit down. That that is impermissible for them. And as Ben Othamin mentions, he says that the asl here, because we're looking at the vahir of the nas, that the Prophet ﷺ prohibited this thing, and we've talked about this uh, many times prior to this, that a nahi you feed a tahrim, or the asl of the nahi you feed a tahrim, that the origin of a prohibition, that this uh, shows that that action is prohibited. And as we mentioned, the opposite of that qaida, or along with that principle, is that the asl fil amr al wujub? That the origin of a command in the shara from the Book of Allah or the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that that action is an obligation. And so, in this hadith, we see that this was prohibited by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And that is because a person should not force another person to get up because this is a type of force. This is a type of uh, aggression, if you will, or a, a type of uh, enmity and can create enmity, can create a feeling in the heart uh, if someone were to, to, to try to overtake someone's place just because they, are, they feel they have status because they're a different tribe, because they're a different race, because they're different this, because of that, or what, because they have a lot of wealth, whatever the case may be, that this is not uh, permissible. And what we see from the apparent meaning of this hadith is that it's absolutely prohibited. Uh, another benefit of this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that the uh, a, a person in their place meaning their, their their place that they're sitting in as we gave the example in the masjid that they are a haq bi makanihi they are the most deserving or they have the most right to that place and someone cannot uh, move them as long as there is no absolute hajja or necessity uh, for that person uh, to move. And likewise, something very important as uh, has been pointed out by the ulama that this is not restricted to just the masjid. As we mentioned, it, it can be the masjid, it could be in a private majlis, uh, private sitting room or living room. This can be even in the sulk, in the marketplace. For example, if people are buying and selling and someone has a stall, for example, that one person, they have a spot already reserved and then someone else comes and tries to overtake that spot. But no, the same manner or uh, Islamic mannerism applies also to the marketplace and also in that situation. Another benefit of this hadith is that it shows that a person should not uh, move the uh, a person from their place of sitting even if it were the person is uh, the father. For example, if the father uh, of a child or the father of uh, of someone uh, you know the father of a child or or a father and his son the son could be in his teen years or whatever the case may be the father should not uh, take the place of that son and that's what we understand from the Vahir or Nas and an excellent example especially and, and we see that sometimes that takes place in the Masjid and a lot of us do it out of ignorance of this uh, of the meaning of this hadith, uh, for example, you find people, um, they're 
son, for example, going to the masjid, maybe they have a young son, maybe he's only 10 years old, whatever the case may be, he come, the father comes late to the masjid, and then he actually takes his son out of the front row, and he gets in the front row. That even this is incorrect, as uh, Ben Othaymin uh, mentions, that this even applies there, that... Uh, That this this should not uh, this should not be uh, take place. Uh, another benefit of this hadith uh, if for example, uh, what we also understand from this hadith is that if a man uh, has to move a, a person, from the Medjus for some other reason, meaning not to because they want to sit in his place, then there's no problem with that. So then this is uh, important for us to understand the difference between someone coming to take your place or someone having to remove you or ask you for whatever reason, some other sense of urgency that you need to leave the Medjus, leave the sitting or the gathering or what have you that that has no effect on this hukum. Uh, another last benefit is we see that from the mannerisms observed from the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam in the shara is that it is necessary for the people who are in, the t in attendance in a gathering or medlis, that if it is said to them to spread out or, you know, to make room for someone, then they should make room. And this is in accordance with the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded that. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Fi Kitab Al-Kareem, Yafsahillahu Lakum. That Allah will make uh, make things uh, maybe easy for you or spread out for you if you uh, if you you do this. You know, Allah commands this in the in the full ayat. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Fi kitabihi al-kareem, ya yuladina amadu ida qila lakum tafassahu fi al-majalisi." فَأَفْسَحُوا يَفْسَحِ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فِي كِتَابِ الْكَرِيمِ And this is a command to the believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the believers. أَهْلِ iman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا يُوا لَذِينَ آمَنُوا O you who believe. If it is said to you, you know, spread out or make room in your sittings, then make room. So Allah commands. It's in the, uh, if this, this is a, a shart. So if, if this uh, first condition, meaning that someone says to make room, then make room. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands, فَأَفْسَهُ uh, Then make room. And Allah will make room for you. So uh, this is a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is coupled with a command if that condition is met. Meaning you are asked in a gathering of good or what have you that someone says make, make room. For example, uh, you find often a situation uh, with the khatib, you know, in Yomu Jumwa. That there, most of the time in masajid around the world, you may not find enough room. And for example, many places where the weather conditions, for example, it's raining and people are praying outside or in the snow and there's not much covering and you have a lot of people in attendance, sometimes people have to pray out in the, in the weather or in the heat. And so it's very important to make every effort to make more room for those in attendance at the Jumu'ah. And so you'll hear the Imam uh, announce during the khutbah and, or during the prayer, or right before the prayer, saying, you know, make room for your brothers, you know, spread out, uh, you know, make, make room and come closer. 
And so this is uh, in accordance with the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in accordance with the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger alayhi salatu wa salam. So we should make room as is mentioned in this hadith of the Prophet salawatu rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi. In the next hadith narrated uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said when one of you eats, he must not wipe his hand till he licks it or give it to someone to lick. Mutafiqun alayh. This is agreed upon. So this is a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. And this hadith um, also illustrates, and it's in the book of Adab, or it's in the comprehensive book, Kita, uh, the Bab al, uh, al Adab, or Adab. And or Bab al Adab. So it's in the book of good manners. So it's also showing that good manners, as we mentioned prior to this, you know, that the khair and, and bir and good manners and husn al khulq, some of these terms are very comprehensive. They are showing various ways and various mannerisms to observe in accordance with the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And from one of those from those mannerisms is what is mentioned in this hadith, and that is one should lick their fingers, clean their fingers appropriately with, uh, you know, using your, your mouth, clean your hand, use your hands uh, when you're eating. And it, that it's so important, the Prophet, والسلام, he said, when one of you eats, he must not wipe his hand till he licks it, so that he should clean his fingers. And this is, this is from the Sunnah of the Prophet. ﷺ. These are the, the mannerisms that the shirk has uh, that is mishroor that is legislated from the shur and it, it it has such grave importance because it shows that islam is concerned about not wasting and uh being extravagant but rather the command is is so strong the prophet والسلام, said uh you know uh, when one of you eats, it's a, not a command, but it's a nahi, uh, he must not wipe his hand till he licks it. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, or give it to someone to lick. So this shows that obviously this is an important uh, um, adab or mannerism to uh, observe. And the subab or reason is explained in uh, in another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wasallam, in which he mentioned that one of us does not is can may not be aware of where the barakah is in their food. So that way, uh, this is a way of trying to gain the blessing of the na'ma and showing appreciativeness to Allah subhanahu wa taala instead of israf which is to be um, wasteful. But instead, this is the mannerism of showing appreciation by actually, uh, you know, finishing one's food completely to the extent of even, even uh, licking or cleaning their hands in that way. And this is a mannerism, of course, that in the West especially, that they, would, that they look down upon, that it's actually an Islamic mannerism which is going uh, in contradiction to probably more recent Western mannerisms, meaning recent as in so many hundreds of years when the, the use of silverware and, and things became uh, no, the norm uh, in the Western world. But probably prior to that, most of human history is they were using their hands to eat and they were cleaning their hands even with uh, by licking their ha their fingers and then washing their hands. So this hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, uh, one of the uh, benefits of this hadith is that a person uh, should try to eat with his hand. And it doesn't mean it is haram if you don't, if you use silverware or what have you. But it is better as far as 
uh, for seeking reward. It is better because we have a command and a prohibition or we have a command here or and, and it's from prophetic advice uh, and it is from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the extent of even licking the fingers and or having someone else lick the fingers. So it shows that it's very, very strong uh, sunnah to observe and better for obtaining ajr uh, than, than eating with a, for a fork or a spoon. And with that being the case, however, it does not negate, and this is very important for us to understand, that a person can eat with a fork and a spoon or a knife or what have you, a utensil. That does not mean that it is impermissible. It is permissible to eat with a utensil as well. But if you are seeking to obtain the maximum barakah, the maximum uh, reward by following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when you're eating, then that is the best uh, way because it is from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi wa sallam, uh, mentioned the even the reasoning or that the, the he mentioned the illa. He mentioned it not in this hadith, but in another hadith he mentioned it. He mentioned the reason behind that, that that is, uh, you know, that may be where the barakah is in the food. We don't know where in the, the, the in partaking in the food that the barakah is. And from other hikmah that we find is not being wasteful and, uh, you know, eating all, all of the food. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows and illustrates that uh, to be, to have humility. That's another benefit we gain from this hadith because uh, by cleaning one's plate, that this is a way of, you know, this is a, a humble thing. This is a humble uh, mannerism to observe in accordance with the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Because when you think about it, the person who does it, if they don't lick their hands and they wipe their hands or they just clean it or they eat with utensils and they leave things on their plate, you know, that is not illustrating the same type of humility as a mannerism. And in fact, you will find that it is reached to such a status where this is illustrated, to, to such a level that you'll find in many countries, unfortunately, especially some of the wealthy ones, and I'm talking about amongst Muslims, that they leave, uh, for example, in, in some certain countries, the women find it a status, and these are Muslim women, to leave something on their plate, and you will observe in the restaurants, and in the ice cream parlors, and in the cafes, for example, a person taking a couple of bites of cake and leaving because it shows that they are not in really in need of this food, that they are, you know, their status. They will drink half their cup of mocha and you see this widespread. And this is a very shameful thing and the opposite of tawada. This is israf. In fact, israf, you will find often massive amounts, and I've witnessed this countless times, uh, now, especially amongst the women, it seems to be the trend, but even the men that you'll find because of the wealth that is found, they're able to make, you know, have whole goats and lots of rice. And you'll see, I, I used to go to gatherings and you saw that they, tons of food would be wasted. Like, you know, and, and tons of rice. And even still now, in many places and restaurants, there's still a lot of food that's wasted. So it shows by leaving that sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the person, the people have inherited an actual a type of ungratefulness and a type of arrogance because you will go to some many poor countries in the world where the people will eat every last piece of that rice from your plate. That whatever's left over from your plate, there's enough fuqara, enough poor and musakin, and I've seen it with my eyes, who benefit from that, from that food. So it shows that the person, the people who are wasteful like that, 
They've already perhaps inherited a type of, in, uh, uh, of arrogance. Well, law understand. Another benefit of this hadith is it also shows the sharia adab of being clean, of cleanliness, of cleaning one's plate, cleaning one's hand, cleaning with the fingers, uh, with the tongue, you know, or with your mouth, and then cleaning your hands with water. That is from the sunnah and washing your mouth out with water. And that's a sunnah that many of us leave or become lazy with. Wallah mistan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and guide us and help us. A last benefit of this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is it also shows that also the permissibility of someone else cleaning your fingers. And most of the time, people would observe that mannerism probably with their spouse or their children, someone close to them. And part of, and, and Ben Othamin mentions, he mentions that this is muqayyid. Muqayyid. Muqayyid, this refers to something being restricted. Meaning that the hukum here is not al itlaq. It's not just general anybody. I, you know, I, I, you know, I finish eating and I have some food still in my hand, some rice, and I just go to the next table and say, hey man, can you lick my fingers? No, that's not what this hadith is uh, illustrating for us, but rather this is muqayyid as long as there's not darar, as long as there's not harm. Now perhaps there wouldn't be harm, but perhaps this would be uh, a strange mannerism if I asked a stranger to do this, or, or and if a stranger actually complied. This could actually be, we don't know anything about this stranger, their hygiene, are they disease free? What about the person offering their fingers? You know, there's many types of issue that could be harm and also even from a point of, uh, of, of, uh, of manners, you know, to have a man licking your fingers, another foreign man licking your fingers, and we know it would be impermissible to have a foreign woman licking your fingers. So we see that you know, from the wisdom that is perhaps implied in this hadith is that it would be someone close to you. But it's emphasizing the point, this hadith is emphasizing the point that your fingers should be clean and first and foremost you should and then those closest to you who are uh, clean and where there's no harm. Those are some of the main benefits of this hadith and we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the shaitan. وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم